All right. So this is WonderCon special guest James Rollins's Spotlight. I'm Mary Elizabeth Giraldi with Creating Conversations in Southern California. And special guest James Rollins is the number one New York Times bestselling author of international thrillers. His writing's been translated into more than 40 languages and has sold more than 20 million books. As a veterinarian, he had a practice in Sacramento for over a decade and still volunteers at local shelters, um, mostly neutering cats, if I recall correctly. Correct. <laughs> Thank a, you. A noble cause. The burbs thank you for helping keep the feral population down. Nowadays, he shares his home up in the Sierra Nevada mountains with his two golden retrievers, Echo and Duncan. He also enjoys scuba diving, spelunking, kayaking, and hiking. He loves to travel and experience new places around the world, which often inspire his next globetrotting adventures. So, We'll probably get back to the ways that maybe this is not the most up-to-date bio. Uh, had this been a WonderCon guest spotlight rather than WonderCon at home, uh, according to the program book, you and I would have been discussing terrorizing siblings, bloody red fingerprints, Indiana Jones, weird science, and conspiracy theories. So we'll probably still hit a few of those. Hopefully so. All right. So, The Last Odyssey, Sigma Force number 15, which is exciting. Yeah. So, I know the Sigma Force titles are written so that you can kind of enter them at any point. So, are they kind of a series slash standalone hybrid? Um, exactly. I don't think except for myself, very few people have read my books in order. Um, I think most people just jump in where they happen to encounter the novel. Maybe the cover is intriguing. Uh, maybe they see it in an airport bookstore, so they pick it up. Um, and I know that's what most people are gonna do, how they're gonna encounter the series. So when I'm writing my novel, they specifically structure it in such a way that any new reader is invited in. Any backstory you need to know, I'm gonna tell you. Any uh, you know, nuggets that, that I need to seed, uh, I'm going to seed there so you're going to feel comfortable entering at any point in, any, in, the, in the series. You know, at this point, my goal is, you know, hopefully entice people to, to read the current book, and if they like it, then they can go back and get the, the bigger arc of these characters' lives through the course of the prior 14 books. Excellent. So, generally, your team is trying to prevent some sort of apocalypse or another. So how do you balance team member survival with that, you know, jump in anywhere? Um, do you just leave the mystery of, oh, this person didn't show up in book 15, perhaps it will not end well for them? Well, my, you know, I actually initially was not doing series. All my early books were standalone adventures. I resisted doing a series mostly for what I describe as a uh, Jessica Fletcher syndrome. Jessica Absolutely, Fletcher Cabot syndrome. Cove. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, there's that old woman from Cabot Cove always tripping over dead bodies. I've never encountered a dead body. Um, so again, you begin to strain your, your sense of, uh, your suspension of disbelief. Because why is this woman stumbling over dead bodies all the time? And it's always hard to maintain jeopardy in a series character because let's say somebody holds a gun against Jessica Fletcher's head in an episode, you know that trigger's never going to be pulled because she's going to be next week's episode. So it's hard to maintain that level of jeopardy. So I didn't really want to, I, I was struggling with that. And then I wrote my novel Sandstorm where I thought it was a standalone. Uh, it's where Sigma Force is first introduced. They're a group of these... Uh, Special Forces soldiers that were drummed out of the service for various reasons, but because of special aptitude or skill, they're secretly recruited by DARPA, the Defense Department's Research and Development Agency. Basically, there's, they're scientists with guns, and uh, they protect against various emerging threats. So they appeared in Sandstorm just as basically support for the main cast of characters, but I liked that group, and uh, I was sort of disappointed when the book ended that there wasn't more stories to tell with them. Then I realized, oh, I can make a series based on that group rather than an individual. Therefore, the threat can come from different directions and nobody's necessarily safe. 
Because uh, sure. at this point, anybody can be knocked off, even major characters, which is, has happened during the course of 15 novels, because Sigma Force can always recruit everybody else. So I want everybody to be on their toes, the readers, so that they, are, they don't assume everybody's going to survive by the end of that book. But I also like a group because it allows me in each book to sort of shift the spotlight onto different, <laughs> different. I mean, there's basically a, a couple members that are like in every book, but uh, the, the team is large and expansive. And so in each book I can bring in somebody new or I can shift the spotlight onto a different character. So it allows me to feel like the series doesn't feel stale or old or you're just, uh, uh, you know, revisiting the same character over and over again. You're getting a glimpse of that uh, sort of core group, but also ancillary characters. Excellent. So, um, darn it, I just lost my phrasing. Um, well, I like to, so what I'm, you know, by the way, just uh, as a side note, you know, my, uh, my belief, what, what, what should have been the final ending of, of Murder, She Wrote, the series, should have been the revelation that Jessica Fletcher was a serial, serial killer and that she's been, uh, you know, murdering everybody all along and framing them. That's the only thing that really makes sense from the, the fact that she's stumbling all, all over those dead bodies. She's actually the source of those dead bodies. Anyways, so I, I, moving on. I think uh, uh, D.P. Lyle also shares that theory. I don't know if you know him, but, uh, I do. but I think I I've had that same well. conversation with him. So um, so you, you've you described the team as scientists with guns, which I kind of love, um, with maybe you know, depending on the situation, more of an emphasis on the science or the guns, depending on which sure. is applicable. Um, and and you've moved them out of technically the armed forces, but you still have a lot of respect for the establishment of, of you know, the armed forces, right? Right, yeah. I mean, basically, you know, I grew up reading, you know, Clive Cussler for the sort of these uh, historical tied adventures. But I also, you know, grew up reading uh, Tom Clancy, uh, get that sort of, I always loved those sort of military thrillers, but also I like, you know, I love Michael Crichton. You know, I had a copy of Jurassic Park on my, uh, above my, my computer here when I was writing my first novel, Subterranean, because I didn't know how to write a novel. So, uh, you know, I've had no formal training as a writer. I was a veterinarian. So I wasn't quite sure when, you know, when, you sh when should you kill off your first character? You know, so I, I would look at Jurassic Park. Well, this is when Michael did it, so I'm going to do the same. When do you see the first, you know, monster, the dinosaur in Jurassic Park? Well, you're going to see the first monster in my book. So, uh, you know, my books are, you know, a little bit of Michael Crichton, a little bit of Clive Cluster Adventure, a little bit of military fiction, like a, a la uh, Tom Clancy. So it's a little bit of everything. Because, so you know, I always, whenever I teach writing, I always tell writers, you should write what you love to read. Uh, as readers have a good nose on them. If you try to chase the market and think, well, this is popular, I'm going to write in that genre or that uh, that subgenre, uh, they have a nose to say that you're not really, you're not enthused with that, you're not passionate about that genre, because to write it well, you need to read deeply into that genre. You need to know what you know the, the, the uh, every nook and cranny, what's the cliche, what's overused, you know, how can you spin something into a new take, and you're only going to be able to do that if if you really enjoy that genre and you've been reading deeply for a while in, in those genres. Absolutely. You shouldn't just watch Unforgiven and decide, hey, I can write a Western. Exactly. Um, so you talked about the science influence, you talked about the military influence, but you also have this, it's more expansive than urban legends, but not quite world mythology. Um, right. I don't know what you would call this, but, but tales that are around that may or may not have substantiated elements. In this case, um, with the Lost Odyssey, you know, the, the sort of trigger question is, we thought Troy was maybe something created by Homer, but then we found Troy. So then how much of the rest of the stories surrounding that now known to be actual city could be true? So, exactly. I'm, I'm you know, one of the themes, I hate using the word themes because it takes me back to that you know, little shudder goes up my back, you know, whenever I say theme, because it goes back to my English lit classes. I still don't quite understand what that means. But you know, what a common theme of my novels is looking for, you know, that, that hidden truth, you know, the, uh, the, the kernel of fact that's behind fiction. Because um, most of the way history is recorded, you know, there's the list of facts and the dry, uh, you know, dates and figures, but also history is, is, 
a, a light is shown in history by, by the literature, by the myths and stories that, that are, are told during that period of time. And oftentimes what seems like fiction usually does have a, a basis of, of truth behind that. So I'm always looking for those historical mysteries, those pieces of history that maybe end in a question mark and something I can maybe explore in, in the, uh, the course of the writing of the novel. And oftentimes the jumping point is, is looking at old stories. In this case, you know, the classic Iliad and the Odyssey written by Homer was uh, basically the only account of the Greek Dark Ages. Why they're the Dark Ages, very little is known about that age. It was a great time of warfare across the, the breadth of the Mediterranean. Uh, some actual uh, historians describe it as World War Zero because all of the major civilizations across the Mediterranean were at war at the same time. And at the end of that war, uh, three major civilizations were brought to their knees. Uh, there was the Mycenaean Greeks uh, fell. The Anatolian Hittites uh, were decimated. Even the Egyptian kingdom well, fell into ruin. Now, what is not known and what is a mystery, one of those question marks, is what brought them all low? And what historians have realized is that there was a fourth uh, enemy involved in that war. Uh, they weren't, even today, we're not quite sure who the enemy was. They came in, they believe they swept in from the eastern half of the, I mean, the western half of the Mediterranean into the eastern half of the Mediterranean and wiped out those three civilizations and then vanished. Now, me as a thriller writer, I'm thinking, you know, who were they? And, and, and basically in my novel, uh, I'm not making it up, but it's actually, you know, one of the, uh, the theories behind that is explored in, in The Last Odyssey. So that's what I love to do. I like to, you know, Homer's, uh, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey was the only really written account of that, of that war. You know, the Trojan War was one battle in this greater World War Zero. And so it gives me a jumping off point to explore that, that blank, you know, section of history and try to fill in that blank as well as I can, both with a mixture of fact and a mixture of fiction. So let's talk adversaries for a minute. Yeah. You know, uh, generally, the if you're going to be um, having um, something that you can battle, you need somebody behind it. Okay. And it's Sigma Force building. is a American-based <laughs> crew. Um, and the adversaries have come sort of from all over. How do you go about setting up adversaries without worrying about othering? It's always a challenge because uh, when you're trying to create the antagonist of your, of your story, you're, you're trying to um, not make them that villain that's you know twirling their mustache and they're evil for the sake of being evil they're they're doing it because they, they believe their cause is just they believe what they're doing is as right as what the heroes think they're doing and so you know the course is trying to build you know some some levels of authenticity in, in that villain so that they feel authentic you also want them to be you know, a significant challenge if they're if they're if they're not worthy of your of, of challenging your heroes then they're not worthy of being the villains in your story you know in this novel we deal with apocalyptic cults i did a lot of research since this book takes sigma force you know through the gates of hell so the book explores you know different cultures views of what happens at the end of the world how is the world going to end and what I learned during my research was that there's a sort of co weird commonality. There's a lot of merging of these uh, end world or these uh, biblical end time type of uh, uh, apocalyptic ends of the world. You know, most people think you know uh, that the, the three Western uh, religions, uh, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, they, are, they blur together uh, how they view the end of the world. And there's a lot of commonality in the way they think the world's going to end. And uh, what I found disturbing is that right now there is sort of a uh, political slash uh, movement that um, it seems to be trying to trigger the end times. They believe that we're in the end times and that we should be making policy based on biblical predictions and biblical prophecies in a goal to push us toward the apocalypse, which I am no, I'm in no hurry to see the end of the world, especially, yeah. you know, I think this is a little eye-opening time that we're in right now with COVID. Uh, you know, maybe we should uh, not be rushing towards the apocalypse. Yeah, but it's not just, uh, uh, you know, biblical end timers. There are also, and there's uh, the president of Iran, 
the uh, supreme leader of, of, of Iran also. They're, they're called Twelvers. They believe in the Twelfth, that the Twelfth Imam is due to return to the, the world. They also believe we're in the end time. So here you have major forces all believing that we're, we're in the biblical end times, and they seem to be gearing us towards, uh, towards crossing that line. And so this book explores, you know, the implications of that and, and how deeply embedded some of that philosophy is in our government and other governments and in different faiths. All right. So you mentioned the elephant in the room slash the virus in the world, COVID-19. And uh, that, that actually makes me want to jump back a few books. So which of the biblical plagues is this and how do we deal with it? Talking about the seventh plague, which was, I believe, the 12th. Sigma force. Right. Yeah, the seventh plague explores this very phenomenon. What if a uh, pandemic occurred, a pandemic that we didn't seem to have any cure for, that was very contagious? So, you know, I've, I've done that viral, can you know, viral pandemic book already, which again, one of the, one of the plagues of the, that beset Egypt from Moses, you know, was a, a curse of disease. And so uh, we explore that in the seventh plague. Um, my next novel, the one I'm just finishing up that will be coming out next spring, is called The Savage Zone. And it's also about viruses. Now, it's not, uh, it's not a pandemic novel, since I already did a pandemic novel. It's more exploring the weird biology of viruses. Uh, viruses are, are, are strange life forms. Um, even today, there's some debate whether they're actually a living life form or something else. Um, so what I learned is that uh, there's some really interesting things and quite terrifying things, even though this is not a pandemic novel coming up. I think it's scarier in many, in many aspects. You know, and I, initially I thought, gosh, why didn't I write The Savage Zone now when it was coming out now? But I thought, no, you probably don't want to read how scary viruses are, you know, while we're in the midst of this. Let's wait till next year, you know. Hopefully right. things will calm down. Hopefully we'll have a vaccine, you know, out there and that we can... Uh, you know, explore the biology of viruses without quite the level of terror in right now. Right. I mean, it's one of those sort of balanced things with content warning, right? On the one hand, it would, might be reassuring to see our heroes overcome this. On the other hand, you know, I'm, I'm reading a book right now in which someone has introduced uh, a, a uh, disease into a contained environment and people are in quarantine. And it um, definitely made me kind of take a step back from the reading for a little bit. It, it definitely had, had, a, had an impact. So um, I find it fascinating that, um, you know, there's an upsurge in interest in, in pandemic movies and in pan, in pandemic novels. Because I think we as writers, I think one of the things we Love that we're gods basically when we're writers. We control our world. And I think why we, one of the reasons why we write is our attempt to solve the unsolvable, to put, put a order upon chaos. Uh, you know, in you know, the mystery uh, genre, you know, the, the sleuth is eventually going to find the culprit and hopefully bring them to justice. Uh, you know, uh, me as a thriller writer, I had these apocalyptic scenarios, but hopefully by the end of the novel that everything's resolved. I think it's, it's, it's a way. I think one of the interests besides getting facts about a pandemic by watching Outbreak or Contagion or reading those pandemic novels out there is that uh, I think there's a desire to, to know that there's a way of resolving that. There's a way, it just puts your mind a little bit at peace to know, well, they, they, those heroes took care of that. You know, we'll get through this too. Right. It may take a while, but yay science. <laughs> exactly. Big yay science. So... One of the unfortunate impacts of uh, COVID-19 and its arrival is, as noted, this is a very different plan than we thought we were making in February. And uh, we thought we'd be speaking in Anaheim at the end of your 12 city tour. And you Correct. are someone who goes a lot of places, not just for book tours, but for research and, so how is that affecting your process? Uh, and, and how is the general situation think, affecting your ability to write, if at all? Well, for writing, you know, most writers are hermits in general. So I think we're, you know, sorry, my dogs. There's, uh, there's my dog right down there. Hi, dog bumpers. Yes, Duncan. Um, you know, I think we're naturally hermits. So to me, 
I've always been pretty structured with my writing, so it's not that my writing day hasn't changed, but definitely was a steep learning curve as my tour sort of got dismantled. Um, a week prior to the release of the book, um, the tour was still on, and then things began to fall apart. You know, I was supposed to be at Tucson Book Festival, that canceled, WonderCon canceled, all the bookstores began to fold and close. You know, most of Barnes and Nobles closed. So all of a sudden, everything dried up and I had to sort of switch, switch gears and pivot pretty quickly. But, uh, you know, this whole method that we're doing today of, of Zooming and, and, and do these interviews uh, was relatively new. I mean, it was, uh, it was not a lot of stores were prepared for that yet. Um, not of authors were prepared for that yet. Uh, the technology was somewhat, you know, even, even we're using Zoom for this and there was a lot of security issues with, with Zoom that yes. needed to be resolved. So uh, it's, you know, it was a rapid change in, 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 in the way that things function. I wasn't quite sure what to do. You know, how, you know, where, you know, I usually when I go on tour, I sign, you know, books everywhere. And so I, I leave a trail of signed books behind me. Uh, and people like the sign books. So like, how am I going to do that? How am I going to get books out there? So um, it's a challenge between you know, trying to uh, recognize that everybody's in a bit of, of, of stress financially, uh, stress from a physical standpoint, stress from being isolated. And then I'm on my, you know, trying to do my dog and pony show of, you know, buy my book. Uh, so it's, it's trying to find that balance between recognize where we're at at the same time, not, you know, not stopping the whole process. Sure, sure. And, and being on the forefront of it, not, not having anybody's example to look at, right? You know, if right. we're still doing quarantine in another month, there may be examples to look at and people will say this was successful, this wasn't, this was the best match to this audience, but you're, you're a pioneer. It was definitely experimental. Um, and it's been fun in some regards, is that social media has always been something I, I've always uh, leaned on. I remember when I first started, uh, the, uh, you know, no authors even had a website. That was like a cutting edge author because I had a website. Uh, so that's how long ago I've been writing. Uh, and, but I've enjoyed social media because it allows you to have that intimate connection between you and your reader that we never had before. Um, you know, I, on my social media pages, I, I posted questions like, you know, in this last book, we don't know who uh, Gray was bedded down with. Was it Seishan or was it Rachel? Vote now. Uh, and so the next, I just sort of got an interpretation of well, how people were feeling about things. And then I wrote my next book based on that. I, I pitched uh, you know, titles with, with social media. So it's fun having that interaction that you never had before. And so again, in this new, in this new environment, I was, wasn't quite sure you know, how to, how do you, you pivot on that? I, I don't want to sure. just become a salesman on my social media page. I like my social media pages to be fun and be interactive, but at the same time, it's my only means of really communicating at this point is via social media to get the word out about the book. So it was a, uh, it was an experiment. It was a lot of things didn't work. Some things did. Um, I remember when it was just as things were beginning to fall apart, I had emailed my publicist and my editor over at the publishing house and said, you know what, what are we going to do? How are we going to, how are we going to, to, to pivot in this? And they were like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> we'll make it up along with you. Exactly. And, so it's been, it's been strange. And I should mention both appreciation for Danielle at William Morrow, who was helpful in allowing, uh, you know, sort of facilitating both sure. our initial plan and this, and also mention that uh, WonderCon exhibitor, Mysterious Galaxy, um, is going to be able to provide copies of The Last Odyssey to any viewers who are interested, and uh, WonderCon will have a link up for that. So, um, so hopefully things will be a little more traditional. I don't know. I like. I don't know what post pandemic is going to look like. Right. I. I. I know. Not. I don't want to say back to normal because I don't think. I, I think we live in a post-pandemic world, or we're headed there. Yes, yeah, so till there's a vaccine available that's readily distributed and used, uh, we are always going, even with things, places are starting to reopen, um, but we're always, it's going to be a lot of social distancing. You know, shops are going to need to have limited number of people entering their, their stores. There's going to be, you know, so distancing that we're going to have to occur. There'll be a lot more cleaning that's going to have to occur. Uh, so it's going to be very... Um, you know, stuttering approach to, to, to everything until we get a vaccine. I think once the vaccine's there, I think then we can see that uh, 
more of a return to normal. So I think this is a good warning sign that, you know, we do need to keep, uh, you know, our antenna up uh, and be prepared because I think we were basically the globe was caught with their pants down with this, uh, with this bug. Agreed. So should things be open or not? Either way, you've got a short story collection coming in September. I do. Uh, the short stories collection is, um, you know, over my 20 years, I've written a bunch of short fiction. It's spread across different media, uh, different, uh, some anthology, some are only e-format. So um, I decided to put them all into one volume. And I did new introductions into the various uh, short stories. because I realized that it, it, they served as a, as a means of uh, showing my 20 years of writing, you know, where I started, where I'm at now. You know, why did I write these certain stories? What did I learn from writing these stories? What was my purpose in writing these stories? So little, little introductions that sort of give a little um, peek into my process, a peek into, into my arc as a writer. But I also didn't want to just sell you old stuff. So there's a new uh, novella. It's a, it's a pretty big novella. It's about 100, 100 plus pages long, featuring okay. uh, very popular pair of characters that spun out of the Sigma universe, uh, Tucker Wayne and his military war dog, Kane, yeah. uh, in, those, in that short story. And previous times they've, they've appeared. I write scenes from both ends of that leash. There's, you know, this, they're written from the point of view of, of Tucker, the former army ranger, but they're also written scenes from the point of view of the dog. Uh, did a lot of training and research into, you know, how these handlers work with these dogs and, and what their capabilities are. And so it's fun to, you know, take my readers and put them into the four paws of that, of that, uh, that dynamic duo. So are Echo and Duncan your beta readers for those scenes? <laughs> no, they basically just beg for treats. So. Aww. So you did have uh, several novels focusing on uh, Wayne Tucker today, um, or Tucker Wayne, sorry. Uh, I actually have a friend named Wayne Tucker, so I tend to flip <laughs> oh, really? it. Uh, yeah, I do. Um, so right now, if you visit your website, you have like, seven different categories one can look at for yeah. different types of books. Clearly the Sigma Force books, standalones, Tucker Wayne, uh, the Sanguine series, which um, I'm so delighted given the meanings of Sanguine that, that you <laughs> embrace that so, so well with your co-author. Um, the Jake Ransom series, one of my personal favorites, your, your kids series. Um, and, uh, and as James Rollins, the Moonfall series, which is a return to your fantasy roots for those <laughs> of us who remember you from back in the James Clemens days, which for uh, readers who may not know is the source of the bloody fingerprints comments. So yeah, you know, back I've always written two books a year. It's always been like a thriller and something else. And from the first decade, it was a thriller and a fantasy. Uh, there was a five book uh, uh, series called the Book of the the Band of the Banished series, uh, Witch Fire is the first book in that series. And uh, the, the premise or the uh, conceit of that series is that these are forbidden texts that you're not allowed to read uh, unless you're given special permission. And you're required to fingerprint each book to verify that that copy is yours in case it should be, you know, fall into the wrong hands. They can trace to who, who, you know, who, you, uh, who originally had that copy. So I thought, well, wouldn't it be fun if I fingerprinted the books myself? Uh, which sounded like a great idea until, you, you know, my fingers are covered in, in red ink and I'm smearing it on my pants, I'm smearing it on the next book, I'm shaking hands and sharing it. So I guess it's a good example of, you know, of COVID, how easily it can spread, because that, that red ink went everywhere by the time that, that was done. So I will never do that again. So I do do doodles in my, in my novel. It's like a little uh, compass rose I doodle in the, for The Last Odyssey, but uh, the, I won't be fingerprinting again. I'm sure at this point it'd be an easy way of getting my, my identity stolen also. Absolutely. But, you know, we've all seen the Mission Impossible movies. Exactly. So, so what got the idea for this new series, fantasy series, just sort of critical mass with you where you said, where you said, you know, cause I think I remember you saying at one point that you had a hard time after a while doing the mindset switch from thriller to fantasy and you didn't want to be moving back and forth. So what sort of I didn't want to do that is that I made the mistake one year of trying to do both simultaneously. 
where ah. I did like one chapter of, of it was when I was writing Sandstorm, actually. I was writing one chapter of the fantasy and one chapter of the thriller. Uh, and then I would switch back and forth. And that probably stripped a gear in my head just trying to do that because when I write, I'm so immersed in that world that it's hard to you know suddenly every week pull myself out of that and go back into this other world. So, um, you know, I always, I don't know, maybe it was just the fact that I had been doing this pattern. I don't like to get in, stuck into a rut where I was doing thriller fantasy, thriller fantasy. You know, I always wanted to stretch my literary legs. You know, I grew up reading a bunch of different genres. Um, that's why my Sigma series is a little bit of Custler, a little bit of Crichton, a little bit of, of Clancy, is that I write all these different genres. And so I think any writer, when they read like that, they always say, I would love to do a mystery or I'd love to do this because I, I like to read that. So I began sort of switching out the fantasy into something else. I would do a you know, co-written project. I never co-wrote something before. I'll do a middle school series because I never did a middle school series. Uh, I'll do a standalone because I haven't done a standalone in a while. So I was doing things that were stretching my literary legs. But this story for the new fantasy series has been brewing probably, I had the gist of this idea about a decade ago and I put it in the back burner. But the problem whenever I put a story in the back burner, it doesn't just sit there. Uh, it just simmers it, and then begins to boil and then it keeps drawing my attention because I have to keep you know, either turning the dial up or down. And, you know, the characters start to appear, the world begins to, to snowball into more and more depth. And then eventually, it, can't, it couldn't be ignored. You know, I just, I knew that I had to tell the story or else it was going to just become a, you know, a bigger and bigger you know, monkey on my back. Uh, so uh, I just finished, you know, uh, my, my, my last collaborative work. So I thought, well, what am I gonna do now? And then I thought, well, why don't I, return to my fantasy roots again and I you know this world this world's been been bugging me for us for almost a decade now so why don't I go ahead and pitch it and I think it's a really cool concept I'm not gonna tell you what the concept is because it's just really cool we'll wait till we're a little closer to release date but uh it is it's a challenge it's, it's a big world it's a uh it's something I don't think anybody's ever done before or attempted to do before so uh I'm excited a little more of that literary stretching Exactly. On something new. And again, I, I've missed that world building, which is unique to, to fantasy. I mean, obviously anybody that writes fiction, they're building an internal world to that, unique to that novel. Whether you're doing, you know, a crime caper or a mystery writer, there's still, it's in your own world. But when you're writing fantasy, you know, you're building the mythology, you're building the history, you're building its stories, you're building its religion, uh, you're building its topography, you're building uh, the cultures, the, the peoples and, and creatures that populate that world. So you, I talked before about, you know, you get to play God as a writer. As a fantasy writer, you really truly are God in that world. Well, and one of my favorite things about your creature building is as a veterinarian, you kind of know how things are supposed to work. and. Right. Accordingly, you have made some pretty messed up things, Jim. <laughs> of course, I mean, my before I was a you know before I got accepted to vet school, my my undergraduate degree was, was biology with an emphasis on evolutionary biology. So I've always liked exploring you know what would happen if a mutagen got loose in the Amazon jungle and began you know merging different species together. What might that look like? That became my book Amazonia. Um, you know, I looked at, you know, what if someone tried to advance the intelligence of animals, uh, that became, uh, Altar of Eden, my novel featuring a veterinarian as a character. So it's always fun taking that background and, and, and again, playing God, I get to build my own, you know, I have a little toolbox of things I've learned from my evolution of biology background, from my veterinary background to make my creatures as authentic as possible is, is make them, you know, make them make sense not just uh, be weird creatures in this weird landscape. And I want them to have uh, evolved in that landscape and make sense in that landscape. Because that's the way, you know, everything, we're an interconnected web. So, you know, if you have an ogre in a forest, you know, what's that, you know, that's, is, he, uh, is he an apex predator? How does that, you know, how does he affect everything around him? What does he look like bio biologically? How do you know what, you know, how many of them are? How many can be supported with, uh, if they've got a huge body mass? So it's fun just, you know, trying to make environmental sense of the creatures I create. Excellent. All right, well, this is the point where normally I would open it up to questions from the audience, but it's just you and me and the puppers, so. Exactly. Um, anything that we thought about addressing that I 
Um, you know, one thing I probably would like to address is that you mentioned before about, you know, the, the military background. And since Mysterious Galaxy is based in San Diego, is I'm, I'm an advisory board member for US for Warriors. You can go to the website. It's US, the number four, warriors.org. Uh, it's a sort of grassroots efforts out of San Diego. And uh, they are uh, an organization that helps so do social programs for veterans. And, and they can always use more funds. And if you go to the website, you can definitely contribute. And especially nowadays, I think uh, they can definitely use more support because, again, uh, they try to do social programs. But as you know, we're all socially distanced. It's a little more stressful for everybody right now. My role in, in the organization is to, to we have a, a project where we, we, we pair up veterans with authors and attempt to get veterans to tell their stories, whether they're just uh, going to be journals for their family, whether they want to help maybe potentially get published. We try to act as mentors on, on you know, helping them craft their skill and hopefully you know, aligning them towards publication. So again, uh, it's, it's a great organization. And if you go to us4warriors.org, support them. Absolutely. Well, thank you for making time with me this morning and uh, hopefully this will all sound good when the fine <laughs> folks at WonderCon tweak it up and, uh, and I very much look forward to getting to spend time with you in person again. I miss you. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Take care. Bye-bye.